This is Immerse, the podcast and book. Composer, sound artist Charlie Morrow explores immersion in public events, broadcasts, music, installations, and environmental systems. Immerse, 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 immerse. This is Charlie Morrow for Immerse, Sound, Light, Space. I think we're in business now. Thanks for joining us. Today, we're talking with Jaron Lanier, musician, author of Who Owns the Future, and inventor of virtual reality. I appreciate very much you meeting me. Uh, I'm working on a book. It's called Immerse, and it's about the design and the inspiration for immersive experience, Mm -hmm. you know, making. And um, I was going to ask you... Of, about your own history of immersive experiences and then what you're working on now. For me, that's a very hard question because it's, you know, decades of stuff and I don't even know how to begin. I, I, made, my, my, I made my first technically supported immer, immersive environment when I was about nine, no, 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 I was, I'm going to say 11. I was about 11. And um, what had happened is my mom had died. I was very, very lonely. And we were living in the area west of El Paso where Texas and Old Mexico and New Mexico meet. And I had met a guy in the services in the military who worked with uh, radios and electronics and he had taught me a little bit and I picked up some electronics magazines and had learned to make the things he used to make those days if you were in electronics obvious like radios and whatnot but then I become very excited by theremins and I made a theremin and I wrote to Bob Moog who wrote me back which was very sweet those days it would take weeks for an exchange like that and I did this crazy thing of connecting a homemade theremin to, um, I took an old TV and turned it into a poor quality oscilloscope, except that I set it up to make Lisaji figures, which are the diaphanous kind of 3D-like spooky figures you can make when you're moving both the X and the Y side of the oscilloscope at once with related signals, you can get these incredibly beautiful shapes and forms and they can evolve slowly and they can shimmer and hover and seem almost alive because they're, they're a little unstable. And then I put, I found a enlarger lens that would be used for print making prints and photography. And I put it all together and I had, and then um, a big bed sheet. (laughs) over a space and I suddenly had this face that when you walked in you controlled these weird spooky organic forms on this sheet and so this was in about 1971 in the desert and was very um, weird and I set it up as a Halloween haunted house and Um, The sad thing for me is that I thought it might be a bridge to some of the kids at that time because I I was extremely lonely and felt completely disconnected from everybody. And it was a kind of um, mean-spirited neighborhood and dangerous. And uh, so the, the bad news was that that didn't work. No kids came. The good news is that it gave me a little bit of reputation that I think protected me because they weren't sure what I was capable of or who I was or what was going on. And just the uncertainty, I think, created a little bit of a pillow of protection around me so that I was a little less likely to get beat up and stuff. So I think it was it, it was uh, functional, if not entirely functional. I sometimes think, you know, that in a way I already had my career with that own, that one little weird thing I did as a kid. 
that that later on turned into virtual reality. That's um, a fantastic story. Uh, I had a parallel experience in that uh, I was living in suburban New Jersey and the son of two shrinks, which was really weird. Uh, first of all, they had their office in the basement of the house where we lived. It was a separate area, big place. And um, the shrinks were <laughs> considered to be very, very weird. <laughs> and, and I found it very hard to relate to the community. I built a, I got a ham radio license and I began, you know, I built, built my own gear and I strung my own antennas climbing on roofs and uh, began, and I learned to speak Morse code. <laughs> <laughs> and that had the same effect. And at the same time, uh, the RF, I discovered, would affect um, tubular uh, fluorescent bulbs. <laughs> and it would give me uh, an instant analog readout. <laughs> so I would have a whole life right. experience going on with the conversations. I would be talking. My furthest contact was Ulan Bator. I have gotten the card because, you know, as a ham radio, you exchange QSL cards. <laughs> So that that was my effort to live someplace else than other than where I was. <laughs> That's really fantastic. I have another story from around that time when I shortly after I, I started building my my first modular synthesizer, um, kind of uh, in the footsteps of people like Bob Moog and Don Buchla. And by now, I don't know, maybe I'm twelve, and so I was building this thing, and uh, so and one day. And I should have known better because I understood how to make a radio, but I accidentally, a patch of mine accidentally made a radio. And when I thought music would come out, this booming preacher's voice came out, <laughs> angry at me and telling me I had to repent and that I was a sinner. And it, it was really kind of fantastic during that era when a synthesizer could do that suddenly. Fantastic story. <laughs> <laughs> There's a, um, our technology is more out of control now than it was then, but the way it was out of control then was kind of more charming. Uh, tell me, what, what do you mean by that? <laughs> well, it was smaller than us instead of bigger than us. So, you know, if I had a synthesizer screaming <laughs> at me... <laughs> It was. It wasn't really that threatening. But if you have uh, some giant cloud computing ser- service spying on you all the time and influencing your life in ways you don't know about who contacts you or what kind of oh who knows just all kinds of things um, that's different and, and of course quite creepy. But we don't need to go into all of that. It's just I was just noticing that the emotion of technical flaws used to be much more tolerable and even charming than it is now. Wow. That's a, a marvelous comment. Uh, I think it may have been because you were in the desert because I, I was in North New Jersey and uh, embedded in a community of uh, professional psychiatrists and New York people. And um, so it was sinister from the very start. <laughs> mm-hmm. Also, we were doing moon bounces and things like that. It just, uh, it there was a, an idea of somehow a large sci-fi universe that was so much bigger than us and more powerful. Mm. And you didn't know how you might, you know, wake the dragon. Oh, yeah. Huh. Well, that's interesting. I mean, another thing about where I lived is that it was... um... Um, UFO rumors. Possibly the most sci-fi place in in America. It was uh, right next to White Sands Missile Range. And in fact, one of our near neighbors was uh, Clyde Tombaugh, who discovered Pluto and was the head of optics research. And that was a piece of incredible good fortune because he taught me about grinding lenses. And although my father was also interested in that, and that helped me in being able to work on optics for virtual reality later. But another thing about living there is... um, Okay. 
there were just weird things f- falling from the sky all the time and weird rumors and very weird lights up in the mountains at night when they were testing different things. Uh, one time, uh, Werner von Braun had shot a missile right into my town, you know. <laughs> and uh, we used to go out, on my, uh, go out on walks and just find little bits of experimental things, experimental proto-satellites and whatnot. I, I might even have some somewhere. They were wonderful machined parts. And um, because of all the strange lights from the tests, there were a lot of UFO rumors. And I still have this weird thing where when people talk about Roswell and UFOs, part of me kind of riles up and says, no, we had much better UFOs, stupid Roswell. Why does why did their UFOs get all the attention? And of course, I never believed in UFOs or aliens, but I, if somebody were going to believe in them, I would want them to believe in the ones from where I grew up, not the ones in Roswell. So that, that bothered me considerably. Well, the difference, of course, was that they were, um, you were aware of this, of the scenery, the vastness of where you were, and the um, what, whatever imagery that would occur in it. It's an enormous theater. Yeah, it was. It's true that the stars were, of course, much brighter back then everywhere, but particularly there, you could see um, all kinds of things that I haven't seen for a while with my eyes, so a lot like Andromeda and. Uh, and with a telescope, it was just incredible looking at globular clusters or Jupiter or something. And the the sky was big, of course, as it's always said, but also it's very beautiful. The sky was just like this, I don't know, it was just this constant entertainment. It was just amazing in New Mexico. That's also often, often observed. And it was just, you know, um, it was a little removed. A lot like we didn't have... Um, there are a lot of things that hadn't come to us yet. Like, for instance, when I was a kid, I hadn't heard the Beatles, even though they were famous, because there just wasn't any radio station that played them anywhere around there. We didn't have Sesame Street until I was well-grown, because there just wasn't... Like, a lot of stuff that was very common in the rest of the U.S. just hadn't quite gotten there. It was still There was still a little bit of a feeling of it not having quite been incorporated into the country. I can imagine. Uh, so this, this, this persisted until you... Uh finally moved away and came to New York? Well, let's see. I think I met you the first time I came to New York. I was still a teenager, if I remember. And then I went back to New Mexico a little bit. And then and then I did a period at Caltech. And then I did a, a little period as a game designer. And then around the turn of the 80s, right start of the 80s, I started working on virtual reality systems. And then I just feel like it would take too long to go into that whole thing. I, I started the first VR company and I named VR and I and mixed reality. And I, you know, I did this, all this stuff for decades with that. But I just, <laughs> I kind of felt like answering you with the earlier stories. Uh. That was the part I was the most interested in. Uh, I think the part about what happened since is well documented in your own books. And you're not only documented, but your thoughts about it have changed over time. And that, too, is published. So uh, I'm more interested in um, what you've just described, those earlier moments. And then if you could jump to the present where, you know, where, where you are now. Right now, there are many things going on. Well, part of it is uh, this uh, it's an expensive hobby, making new VR equipment. So I hooked up with one of the, the tech titans. I've been working with Microsoft on this stuff for a while, and we made a, um, a new kind of a headset that Microsoft sells under the name HoloLens, which is different from the classical VR headset in that you add new stuff to the world. Um, we can add a uh, fake stuff to the real world and it was much, much harder to do. And I think has in- an incredible pragmatic potential in a way for creative stuff. We still don't know as much about it as an expressive form. I've had some chances to have students augment each other, like add horns and wings and this and that tattoos and three dimensional tattoos or whatever things on, on your body. You couldn't do otherwise while you still see the person physically and, I think there is a lot of potential in that. It's it's ultimately not as fantastical as, as uh, classical virtual reality, though. Although the two can blend together. But at any rate, that so that's in general one thing I've been involved in. I've been in uh, virtual reality specifically 
right at the second, I have an, a wonderful eccentric group of designers and researchers working with with me on on different projects. And as is uh, well known, I'm I'm not happy with how the internet turned out, and I feel we're all going a little crazy with it. And I'm interested in trying to simulate an alternate future in advance to try to figure out how various alternatives I and other people have been talking about might actually be experienced. Like um, if you imagine some future, like I want people to be paid for their stuff in the future. So there's more of a distribution of rewards from the internet. And, and so if you, if there's an idea like that, does it mean you have to spend every waking minute thinking about, whether you're getting paid, is it like how much does it consume you? So we're trying to simulate what it's like to live in a future like that to try to get a feeling for how to create designs that are workable or indeed if maybe I'm kidding myself and there's no design that's workable. But at any rate, that's a kind of a design research is what we call that. Another thing that's been very much on my mind is the world's been more and more guided by these programs that are described as AI programs. I don't like that term, but at any rate, this idea that these programs are making decisions for us and optimizing our lives. But the problem with them is that to a scary and bizarre degree, we don't really fully understand how the programs work or why they work or how they fail or when they fail or how to get them to do what we want. And so I've been working on trying to describe them in new ways, both with with different mathematical approaches, but also just visualizing them in different ways, throwing as much visualization and user interface as I can at them to see if maybe they start to make more sense. So that's another project going on. I I think those are the headlines, yeah. Marvelous. And I would, as a kind of a last thought, I noticed uh, the last time we met, you were playing the piano when you were playing beautifully. And I'm just wondering uh, how how music is functioning for you, uh, period. Well, you know, it's been a wonderful time for me musically lately, mostly in terms of live performance. I've been sitting in when sometimes when I'm in New York with uh, John Batiste in the Colbert Band, and I bring the most exotic possible instruments, and we figure out some way to incorporate them into the show. I, I had a very nice experience playing on a, on a number one hit tune the first time ever, which was last year with uh, T-Bone, Burnett, and, and that was that was a cool thing. So, And I've been uh, doing some more work with Phil Glass, uh, who I worked with for years. And so, so there are all kinds of musical things that are just really unexpected at this point in my life and really I'm very happy to, to be able to do. The, uh, the thing that's left me puzzled is since the traditional recording industry has kind of been destroyed, I'm not sure how to release music in a way that works for me. I've, I just haven't found a way, so I stopped releasing music. I just haven't been a source of my own music. I've been more a performer working with people who come along, and I am doing some recording, but I don't know to what purpose. So that remains a bit of a puzzle, but presumably something I'll figure out. Something, you know, I'll figure, I'll figure something out. Well, that sums it up for me. Thank you so much for <laughs> taking the time to uh, have the, have this chat. I, it's really always wonderful to be in touch. I'm very happy we're still in touch after all this time, and I wish you the best of luck with this project. Thank you very much. Sound, light, space, 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 space. Thank you. This is Immerse, the podcast and book. We are delighted to have you join us. Immerse is produced by Charlie Morrow, Sean McCann, and Bart Plantenga for Morrow Sound, Vermont and Helsinki, and Recital Edition, Los Angeles. I'm Anea Lockwood. Immerse. 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 Immerse.